Welcome everyone to the MIT Category Seminar. Today we have Joachim Koch, Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona, is going to talk about the incidence comodal bialgebra of the bias Dolan construction. Hi Joachim, please go ahead. Um, so let's first make sure that, um, so there was a doubt whether um, my piece of paper would automatically become active as the main window or you have to do that yourself. How does it look? It looks okay. We are seeing okay. this. Um, I see your paper without doing anything, so it looks good. Okay. Um, so, the title is the incidence co-module by algebra Oops. of the bias Dolan construction. Um, so there's a preprint where you can find all the details if you need them. So that's, that's 19, 12, 11, 320. Okay, uh, so let me start by um, announcing the theorem and then explain as much as I can. So the theorem says that for any operator P, you can look at the free monad on P and you can look at the by stolen construction. Then you can take the two-sided bar constructions of these two uh, monads. So all this I will explain. Yes, these are the bar constructions. Then you can take the incidence by algebras. So that will give something here and it will give something here. And the theorem says that H is a co-module by algebra over B. So that's the theorem. And uh, maybe your question is not uh, why this is true, but maybe your question is why would anybody think of thinking about this? So um, I will spend most of the talk explaining why um, I came to consider this question. Okay. So, sorry, Joachim. Sorry, Joachim. So there seems to be a small problem with lighting. So it's flashing. Is there any way you can make the table a bit brighter, like turning off, turning on a lamp or something? Uh, I have it very strong lighting already. Um, okay. What if you turn it off then? Let me try to turn off this one. Is it more stable so, now? Uh, well, let's go to the next slide and see. It's readable, but uh, yeah, it could be. Try like this. Thank you. Okay, so uh, co-algebras in combinatorics, well, and bi-algebras. So co-algebra, I mean monoid in the category of vector spaces, nothing like co-algebras in computer science. So these express uh, decompositions. So that's some kind of uh, decompositionality principle that you want to obtain info about combinatorial objects by splitting into smaller objects. So uh, there, there are many examples of this. For example, you have functions and you want to compute Möbius inversion or antipodes or uh, some kind of renormalization. I put some quotes here because it's a very small uh, brand of renormalization. So uh, the fundamental fact which is some, sometimes called the fundamental theory of co-algebra or the local nature 
is that every element of a co-algebra spans a finitely finite dimension co-algebra. So this allows you to work very locally. You just pick one element and when you co-multiply, you get smaller and smaller things and therefore it will end up being finite dimensional. Um, so an example of this, uh, that's the incidence co-algebra of a category. So pick a category and then you let you, you consider the free vector space spanned by the set of objects, sorry, set of arrows. And then you define a co-multiplication. So you co-multiply an arrow by summing over all ways it could have arisen by composition, first arrow A and then arrow B. You put A here and you put B here. So that's the co-multiplication. So this is a map from uh, like this. And you should also say what the co-unit is. The co-unit is equal to one if f is an identity arrow and zero in other cases. So um, th this is really a very basic example of what this is all about. And it's important to see that uh, this category could be just a poset. And in that case, it's the classical uh, construction and combinatorics of the incidence co-algebra of a poset. And so maybe I should put two names here, Le Roux for the category case and Rota for cosets. Now, bi-algebras, um, that's the same thing, uh, but you also have uh, the ability to take disjoint unions. So it comes from uh, structures closed under disjoint union. And in that case, you, you get not just a co-algebra, but also uh, algebra structure just by taking disjoint union of uh, the combinatorial objects that span your, your vector space. So, um, in this forum, maybe it's good to think of uh, parallel composition. That's the algebra structure. And then serial, and now it's not composition, it's decomposition. That's the co-algebra part. Okay, now, um, What's more powerful than just to have a co-algebra structure is to have uh, two co-algebra structures and they should interact. So here comes the definition of um, co-module by algebra. So let B be a commutative by algebra. Then, uh, Co-module by algebra over B is a by algebra object in the symmetric monoidal category of let's say left B co-modules um, G. So uh, that's the definition. Uh, so note first of all that to talk about co-modules, you just need that B should be a co-algebra. Then you have co-modules. Uh, if it's not just a co-algebra but a bi-algebra, then you gain a tensor product and uh, a neutral objects. And if it's furthermore a commutative bi-algebra, then you also get the braiding. And when you have all this, then it makes sense to talk about bi-algebra objects in this symmetric monolithic category. The braiding is a symmetry. So, um, in particular, so this means that 
the four structure maps for a bi-algebra, which are multiplication, co-multiplication, unit, and co-unit, they should all be B co-module. So um, if A is such a co-module bi-algebra, well, first of all, it has um, the co-module structure. Then uh, let's look at the co-multiplication of H. So that's a map like this. And one of the axioms, just by saying what it means to be a bi-algebra inside co-modules says the following, that um, here you can also do nothing on B and that's B and the co-multiplication. And that should be the same as, and now I need to tell you in which sense H, sensor H is a B co-module. And it works like this. First, you use the co-action in each factor. Then you take, um, you use the braiding. You can put the Bs over here and you can multiply them using the algebra structure of B and these just go down here. So to say that this diagram commutes is to say that the co-multiplication of H is a B co module homomorphism. Uh, so if you want to write this in string diagrams, then um, here I do first the co-multiplication. Then on each, I do the co-action and I did the braiding here. And then finally, I multiply these two. So that's going this way around. The other way around is easier. It just co-multiply first and then use the co-multiplication of H here. So this is this and this is this. So in string diagrams, the, one of the actions for co-module bi-algebra is this one. So this is a left co-distributive law. Okay, now, um, we get closer to um, the topic of, of this talk. So that's a famous example uh, from numerical analysis. And it's the uh, Halak, Ibrahimi, Fat, Manchon, Co module by algebra. Um, so I don't want to go too back in its origins, but it comes from numerical analysis. Um, so suppose you start with a vector field and you want to integrate it. Um, so then um, you can expand Y as Taylor series. And then you can expand further. In fact, you can make an expansion uh, over trees. So it goes a little, goes like this. You sum over all trees. And then you put a coefficient of each tree. Then you put something called the elementary differential associated to T. And then you put some, um, some uh, power series stuff. So what is this? This is elementary differential. Uh, this is something that is actually discovered by Cayley. It's a way that um, for each tree, you assign uh, a vector field. For this tree, if you do the following, if you take the double derivative and evaluate on the original vector field. So the first derivative is something that takes a point and produces a linear map. The second derivative is the derivative of that. So that's something that takes a point and returns a function that gives to every point a linear map. So that's the same thing as a bilinear map. So you can put in the two original vector fields like this. Uh, so these are the elementary differentials and they appear uh, when you make these expansions. Uh, so this is actually uh, the first time in mathematics where small 
combinatorial things like this are called trees. And um, I have here a copy of uh, Kaylee's paper. I don't know how much you can see. It's a very short paper, four pages. But already on the second page, you can see these nice trees. Um, so that's something that goes uh, quite a while back. Now, um, in this context, the important thing is the discovery of butcher, which is in the 70s, I'm not exactly sure. Um, and there's a group law on these, so these are called B-series. So here I wrote down just one B-series, namely the exact solution. But for each series you write down like this, there's a numerical method associated to it. And all these methods form a group. Um, now this group law is the group of characters on a Hopf algebra. Oops, H. Um, and I want to describe this Hopf algebra for you. It's the butcher, well now it's called butcher, Con Kramer, uh, Hopf algebra. So Con and Kramer's name became attached to this uh, because it also turns up in renormalization. Um, and maybe I actually want to start there. Let me just see on time. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so in perturbative renormalization, you, you want to take, um, well, you have big sums of Feynman amplitudes that to each graph assign a number or something more complicated. And in the end, uh, you want to disentangle graphs into smaller graphs. So it turns out that there's a very nice co-multiplication on these graphs. So here I just take an example. Uh, you co-multiply a graph in the following way. Um, let me see if I can write it vertically. So it's about picking out subgraphs. So either you could pick out nothing, that's the algebra unit. And in that case, on the other side of the co-multiplication, you get the same graph. Or you could pick this small subgraph here. And then on the other side of the tensor product, you should contract that subgraph to just the vertex and you get this one. You could also pick out this one in which case the um, right-hand side would be like this. Or you could pick out both. And then you should contract each of them to a vertex. And finally, you could pick out everything. And then this one um, is just the algebra unit. And so this plays an important role in renormalization, at least in some brands of renormalization to um, figure out what should be the renormalized amplitudes on a big graph by splitting it into smaller graphs until you get down to the bit smallest building blocks where you know um, how to do. Now, uh, so this is uh, Kramer and Con Kramer around, uh, ninety-eight. Now, in fact, Kramer had already seen that the essence of this co-multiplication is actually just the nesting structure of the graphs. So in this case, the nesting is like this. There's a subgraph here, and there's a subgraph here, and then there's the whole thing. So the corresponding tree of the nestings is just this little graph here. Sorry, this tree. Um, so this one is the Hopf algebra of graphs. Now I will explain the corresponding Hopf algebra of trees. And each tree should just indicate the nesting structure of the graphs. So here there's, so this is about graphs. And this one is about trees. Uh, so this is also, so this one is called only Konkreimer Hopf algebra. This one is also called Butcher Konkreimer because it is the Hopf algebra whose characters give Butcher's group law. So how does it work? Well, uh, now it's about making cuts in a tree. And here we could uh, either make the cut above all edges. That means, sorry, I want to start with below. No, I want to start with above. So the first cut is this one. 
Then above the cut, there's the trivial tree. And on the other side, there's the whole tree. So that corresponds to this and the same nesting. The second option is to cut like this. That will give just a point here and this tree over here. The third option is to do the opposite thing. And here, in the case of trees, you get the same result. Over here, it was different, but the nesting structure are the same. Finally, you could cut like this. Then you get uh, these two dots on the left and only this dot on the right. And finally, you could cut below everything and you get the tree itself and the algebra unit. So this is the kohn kreimer hopf algebra of graphs and this is the butcher kohn kreimer hopf algebra of trees. Uh, so these are sums, I should, sorry. Writing vertically is not so obvious. Um, now I can finally come back to the Kalak, Ibrahim, Ifat, Manchon, Kumudul, Bay algebra. It takes these two ideas and join them to a single one. So um, I think I can keep this here just for a second. So there's a second co-multiplication on trees. And it just says, okay, a tree looks like a graph, so we should be able to have the same kind of extraction of subgraphs, uh, co-multiplication. And I will call that B. This one I already called H. Oops. So now it works like this. You have to extract sub trees. And uh, the way to do that is that you should cover the tree with sub trees. So you could do like this. You could do like this. Of course, you could take the whole thing or you could take um, just this. So there are four terms in the sum. Uh, you're not allowed to take this one because this is not a tree. Uh, so uh, in each case, I should take the forest of all the um, pieces on the left. So that gives this one. And then on the right, I should contract the blobs. So that will give, I contract this whole thing to this, and then this one will remain here. Here it's, uh, it's the same. Here I contract everything to a point. Um, and then I just get this. Sorry, what should I say here? Um, no, no, sorry, I take out one blob and I contract everything to a point. Here I pick out just the individual nodes and each of them I contract to a point and I get this one. So um, the Kalak, Ibrahim Ifat, Manchon says that uh, H is a co-module by algebra over B. Uh, and this is interesting because uh, this co-multiplication also turns up in numerical analysis. Uh, it was discovered maybe 30 years after Butcher. Uh, it's also an operation on B series called substitution. That's Charté, um, Ayra, and Wilmot. Um, okay, this is the starting point um, for this. Uh, it's this very nice co-module bi-algebra structure between the uh, butcher con kreimer co-multiplication, which is uh, cutting trees. And then it's the Chartier, Haira, Villemar, Calac, Ibrahim, Ifad, Marchand co-multiplication here um, about extracting subtrees. Um, okay, that was a long um, background. Um, now I can start, let's see my plan. Yeah, now I should come to the Biostolan construction. So this is, as you can get, uh, 
Weiss and Dolan, um, 98. Um, so it's it's often called the Weiss Dolan construction, but it's a little bit, uh, uh, I mean, they did so many things. Why should precisely this one be called Weiss Dolan construction? It's a little bit the same situation with the Grotendieck construction. I mean, among all uh, Grotendieck's big achievements, why should this exactly has, have his name? I say this because um, there's actually a way uh, found by Michael Batanin and uh, Martin Markle to interpret this as a Grotendieck construction, but an operatic Grotendieck construction. So um, let me explain what it is. Um, so we should talk now about colored operats. Uh, so that means that uh, there are operations like in any operat, but now uh, there are input colors and output colors. So this would be an operation in P. And then inst instead of just say saying the arity of the operat, which would be N in this case, we need to indicate all the colors. So this is an n array operation from the n tuple x1 to xn and output color y. So all these are colors. You should also call them objects. It's better to maybe to call them objects uh, because an example of this, well, I should first say now there's a composition. The composition says that whenever you have uh, configuration on two levels of operations, you can contract the whole thing to a single operation. And of course, when I say configuration of operations here, it's important that all the colors match. So if this is an operation with input x1 and x2 and output y1, then the next operation at this level should have inputs y1 and y2 and output sets. And this would be in now x1 up to x4, z. And this should be associative, and there should be for each color a unit operation um, like this. Now, uh, it's good to call them objects because an important example of this is a small category. A small category is the same thing as a color operate with only unary operations. Uh, so that's just to say that if you have an arrow from X to Y, you just write it like this, and then you do all the operate business as usual. So small categories are a, a special class of colored operates. Okay. Um, to do this in an efficient way, I will reinterpret interpret operates as polynomial monads. From now on, when I say operate, it means colored operates. Uh, the polynomial formalism is, is very nice to get out the combinatorics underlying all this algebra. And it's for the following reason. So a polynomial Oh, end of end of function. Sorry, I can't write. Um, from a slice over i to a slice over i is one given by a diagram of sets like this. So there are some set maps S, P, T, and the way such a diagram gives rise to a functor is to do pullback along S, write it down to pullback along P and left adjunct to pull back along T. So uh, you can write out that an explicit formula, which is maybe useful to explain the terminology. So uh, a set over I, that's the same thing as an I indexed family of sets. And if you spell out all these adjoints to see what they do, well, they will return uh, another family over I, and it has the following formula. You sum over all the B in the fiber over J, sum over fiber here. Then you multiply over 
the, the fibers here of this map. And finally, you put the variable corresponding to the image of that element. So that's SE. So this is the formula for evaluation of a polynomial functor. And you can see that it's a sum of monomials. Well, it's a family of sums of monomials. So that's why it's called a polynomial functor. So um, <clears throat> in practice, you will restrict to the case where P is a finite map. That is precisely the characterization of this whole functor is uh, P. It's to say that P is finitary. It means it preserves filtered cool limits. <coughs> now, uh, what are these sets, the nice combinatorics? Uh, the point is that you should think of P as the set of corollas. So each P you picture like this. Then the output color is you apply this map. This whole thing, the incoming edges is the fiber. And that's a finite set now. And each of these fibers, so that's an element here now, it has a color. So uh, you can say x e1 up to s e n, if it's a monomial operation. So the interpretation of the elements in P is that they're colored operations like this. Uh, and if it has a fiber of size n, then it's an n area operation. Um, so this is precisely the uh, structure underlying operas. So a polynomial monad well it's a polynomial endofunctor with monad structure. So this monad monad structure should be Cartesian. Um, now we can come back to operates. So um, there's a theorem that says that operates are finitary polynomial monads. Um, so this is Mark Weber. So to make it precise, you should put some conditions. Um, now, um, that's important, but the nice thing is that uh, the conditions go away. In higher category theory. So already over group point instead of sets, uh, you can uh, dispose of these conditions and then you can say precisely that operates are finitary polynomial monads. But now you need to say operate in groupoids. So that means you now have a groupoid of colors and a groupoid of operations and so on. Um, so this is in a paper of mine with uh, David Geppner and Rune Hauksing. Okay, um, now we are ready to start the theorem. So here is the theorem again. You need to form the free monads and you need to form the bi stolen construction. So let me now explain the free monads and then I finally come to the bi stolen construction. So, free monads on P. So, for this, P does not need to be an upright, it could be any endo function. Um, so, it exists just by the fact that we are talking finitary endofunctors now. Uh, what is important here is that it's polynomial again, and it's represented by the following diagram. It has the same colors, doing free monad does, does not change that. But now instead of just having the corollas as operations, now it has all three trees. <coughs> and the arity of a tree is its set of leaves. So that means that this set here should be uh, the set of 
leaves, uh, trees with a marked leaf. So then from that, you can return the color of the leaf. Here you forget the marked point, and here you return the color of the root edge. So this is a polynomial representation of the free monad on P. <coughs> now finally, uh, the bias dolan construction. Um, P suck. So uh, usually in the literature, it's usually denoted P plus. Um, I adopted this new notation because it turns out it's related to multiplication as composition. So if you do it the very easiest case, you arrive at power series. And then uh, this one will turn out to be multiplication of power series. So that's a star, that's nice. And this will be substitution of power series. Uh, this seems to be general principle. So I, just start, I started to denote it with a cert. Um, it goes like this. Um, so many, many people uh, studied the bias dolan construction after Bias and Dolan. So in particular, Hermida, Makai, and Power, and uh, Eugenia Cheng. And so the version I will present here is essentially uh, Tom Lenster. And the polynomial version of that is uh, a paper, paper of mine with uh, Shoyal, Batanin, and Mascari. Um, so it goes like this. First, you look at polynomial into functors over P. So P is an operand. And now that means polynomial monad. Then there's a forgetful functor from polynomial monads over P down to endofunctors. And uh, for example, exactly the same reason as here, there's a left adjoint to this one. So there's a free polynomial monad functor over P. Now, there's a canonical uh, uh, fundamental equivalence saying that this is the same thing as Z over B. So what is B? Well, P was polynomial, so it's given by a diagram like this. So B is the set of operations. So this is uh, the fundamental equivalence driving the whole thing. And that's not so difficult to see because uh, you need to know that natural transformations of polynomial functors are given by diagrams like this. So if you have polynomial functors over P, so that's some diagrams like this, as uh, monads, well, here it's only an endofunctor. This should be Cartesian. That means that this whole data is completely specified just by giving this one. The rest is pullback and composition and composition. So. And to give a polynomial endofunctor over P is the same as giving just a, a single element in this category. Okay, now this adjunction induces a monad and you transfer, you, you transfer it along this equivalence and you get a monad here. And that monad is the bias dolan construction. Okay, all this is very formal. Now the good news is that uh, you can extract very nice combinatorics from this. And this, I think, is a, a general feature of, of um, this whole approach to these things that um, you do things quite formally with categories, but then you extract nice combinatorics. Uh, so here's a theorem, which is uh, from K, J, D, N. It says that uh, this new monad is polynomial again. And it's given by the following representing diagram. Now, uh, the old operations have become the new colors. That was already one of the uh, key features in by Stolen's original paper. And uh, here we find again the P trees. Oops, maybe I did something 
I was maybe not precise enough. So when I said trees here, that was obviously silly because it must depend on P. So these would be P trees. That means that every node is decorated by, the, by an operation and every edge by a color. And of course that should be compatible. So it's about P trees. Yeah, it's again about P trees. But now the monad substitution law is very different. It's not about grafting onto leaves. It's about substituting into uh, nodes. And that means that the, this should be considered in this case, a ternary operation because it has three nodes. So that means that this fiber, which should encode the arity, should be all the possible ways of putting a marked node on the tree. So this set of group point here is the set of all trees with a marked node. And once you have a marked node, you can return that node. So that's an, oper an operation. Remember that these are corollas. Now here you just forget the mark and here this is where you need p to be an operand because you want to contract this whole tree to a single corolla and this is uh, the monad multiplication allows you precisely to do that so for any big configuration of p operations which is to say that it's a p tree the monad law allows you to contract it to a single corolla so this is the polynomial interpretation, uh, the polynomial representation of the Biostolan construction on, uh, on, on P. So it means that if you want to look how it does, it's about substituting a tree into a node of another tree. Now, as always in colored operates, the color should agree. So you first have to see uh, what's the receiving node, which color has it. That's this one. And then that should correspond to the output color of the thing you want to substitute in. So in this case, it has to be a binary tree. And then in, inside here, all, all crazy stuff could happen. So you can substitute this whole thing into this node and you get, well, I don't know if I can repeat the crazy stuff like this. So this is how this substitution looks if I only substitute into one node. If I have to do the full monad substitution, then of course I should do it in every node. <clears throat> okay, uh, now we have the by stolen construction. Um, now we can finally start to work towards the commutual by algebra. Uh, for that, we first need the two-sided bar construction. Yeah, and now my small camera here is already burning out of battery. Uh, so the small picture may disappear, but that's not so important. So um, the two-sided bar construction uh, on an operat has a long story in algebraic topology. I cannot give it full um, uh, respect here. Um, the point is that the fact that P is required to be finitary means the middle map is a finite map. So it means that it has a map to the classifier of finite maps. So that means that there is actually like a Cartesian square like this. So this is finite sets and this is finite pointed sets, like group words now. Uh, this polynomial monad is the free symmetric monoidal category monad. Uh, and the fact that P is an operand means that everything fits into a diagram like this with a map F here. So now again, the principle, I write down something very abstract and categorically, and then I extract the combinatorics. So the bar construction of P relative to S is a simplicial group word given as follows. Um, first it has S of F1 like this. 
then it has S of F lower shriek. Sorry, I wanted to call this R because later I will substitute P star and P plus for this R. So bar constructions always look a bit like this. It's something very formal you write down whenever you have a one monad over another in this way, you can write down this. Now, uh, now you can unpack it and see what is the combinatorics of this. So F shriek of one, so what is one? Well, one is the terminal object in which category? Well, this category, because that's where the monad lives. So if you take F shriek of that, you just get I, the set of colors. So that means that this is the free symmetric monoidal category on the set of group point of colors. What about this one? Well, R of one, if you stick in the terminal here and you do the prescription from polynomial functors, you see that it's just B. And when you put it down here, that becomes, sorry, it's B over I. And when you put it down along F street, you get this set of group point B. So this one is the set of all operations, and then you want monomials of that. And you can continue this explicit description and you see that what you get here are precisely two level trees. So that means that it's a configuration with precisely two levels where all the nodes are decorated by operations of R. Uh, it, it's a P-tree. And you can see precisely what are all the face maps this one returns the roots. This one returns the leaves. And this is where you need the S. And you cannot do this thing without including this monad S because if you want to look at uh, D1 of this thing here, you don't get a single color, you get a monomial of color. So that's these leaves, and that's why you need this S. The same thing happens in every degree. If you just have a two level trees, then D naught, that's the root level. So that's uh, this thing. The middle face map, that's the monad. You contract the whole two level tree to a single corolla. And the top, again, that would be to look at the top layer here. That's not a single operation, it's a family of operations. So that's why you need this S. And then you need the S all the way up. So the bar construction has this uh, explicit combinatorial uh, description. Uh, now we want to apply the bar construction to the two operas we have. So uh, we want to look at bar of this. And we want to look at bar of this. So I should just take um, this and unpack because I know from the previous, let's start with the, the free monad. Here's a picture. These are the new operations and the colors are the same as before. So that means I can just write down this. Here I have the free symmetric monoidal category and the set of colors. Here, I go back to the description of the bar construction. I should have the free symmetric monoidal category on the group order of operations. But now the group order of operations are the p-trees. So that means that in this degree here, I should put all p-trees and then I should take monomials of that. And I continue the next level well, the next level in the general case should be two level trees where each level are operations. But now the operations are themselves trees. So that means that if I first write the level, then below here, I should put a whole tree. And up here, I should put another tree. So what you see is that you get P trees, with a cut and you should take families of that. So P-trees with a cut, well, formally it means 
a tree whose leaves are decorated by other trees. But you can see here that it could also be regarded as a whole tree with a specification of a cut. And this is precisely what we had in the butchercon crime of co-multiplication of trees in the beginning. So this goes on. Now we do the same for uh, the bistolan construction. So let me find the bistolan construction. Uh, here it is. The new operations are the old trees and their arities are their nodes. So um, that means that the new, sorry, the new colors are the old operations. So that means that in degree zero, I should take families of old operations. In degree one, well, I look it up. The new operations are the old trees. So I should just take all trees here and families of that forests. So you see that the two bar constructions, um, they agree in degree one because degree one are precisely the operations. And the two both have uh, trees as their operations. And now it becomes a little bit more tricky because now I should really take trees and then I should decorate each node because the nodes are now the input slots so I should decorate them with new operations and that should be compatible with the colors. So that means that I should draw inside each of these blocks a whole tree. Like this. These are, this is degree two in this centrisial group. Um, and now we should look a little bit what the face maps do. Um, the bottom face map should just return uh, the whole contraction. So that's the monad multiplication. Uh, the upper face map, as always, that should give a family of things, not a single thing. So that should return the nodes. And the same thing we see in higher degree. Um, maybe I don't write all the face maps uh, just to save time. But the point is that the top face map will return will we return the blocks. So here we have a blocked tree. Uh, so if you look inside each block, you get a tree and you get a whole family of them because there could be more than one block here. Okay, now we have uh, the two bar constructions. Now we should take incidence co-algebra. Well, in fact, incidence by algebra of these. So, So incident co-algebra, I will follow the prescription of the beginning of the talk. I just need to say that it's also a bi-algebra. And that's because uh, these free symmetric model category applications, it means that I can think of this, this whole thing that's a forest, it's a P forest. So it has a notion of disjoint union and it's clearly compatible with all the kinds of extra structure we put up here. So that means that if we take incidence co-algebra, we get actually a bi-algebra for free. So uh, let's go back and remember for a category, how you multiply an operation. And remember that an operation is just an arrow. And you look at all the way you can factor it and then you write A here and B here. Now, you could write down the nerve of this category, which is um, a kind of simple-minded version of the bar construction. If you do that, then you can write this uh, co-multiplication formula in the following way. F is now an element of the set of arrows and you co-multiply in the following way. You sum over all two simplices such that the long edge, oops, is F. That's what, this is a triangle, a commutative triangle, and F is the long edge. And then here you return 
the shortages of this simplex that's just A and B. So I can do that now for my two bar constructions. Apply the same simplicial machinery to get co multiplications. These co multiplications will both live on the vector space spanned by degree one. So I will get co multiplications on the symmetric monoidal category on the set of P trees. So I just call well, S T P works. There's one corresponding to uh, the free monad and one corresponding to the by stolen construction. Uh, so let's do the one corresponding to star. So it should take a P tree Then it should look at all the simplices whose middle face map gives that P tree. That just means that I remove the cuts. So I'm summing along this fiber. That means I'm looking at all possible cuts of this tree. So that means if this is tree T, I'm summing over all the cuts. And then the two face map returns respectively the top part and the bottom part. So um, this is essentially Butcher con Kramer. Okay. Essentially, because it's another kind of tree. It's not the combinatorial trees, but now we're talking operatic trees. And similarly, if I describe the co multiplication of um, the by stolen construction, well, I look up in my simplicial, the two sided bar construction here, and I say I should co multiply a tree by looking at the fiber of the middle face map. The middle face map just forgets all the blobs. So that means that I'm summing over all droppings of the tree. And then um, D2 just returns the blobs and uh, this one contracts the block. So here I get the blocks, and here I get the contractions. So except for the fact that now we are with operatic trees, this is similar to the Kalak, Ibrahim, Ifart, Manchon co-multiplication. So um, that was a very long detour to get something not that difficult namely this one. But now it fits into a big machinery. Uh, and I should also say that this works for all, all P. Um, for example, you could take P to be a category. Okay, now it remains, of course, to um, proof of the theorem. Uh, I don't know if I have this theorem easily here. The theorem says that uh, the, bias, the incidence by algebra of the bar construction of the free monoid, free monoid is a commutable by algebra over the incidence by algebra of the by stolen construction. Um, I don't want to give the proof. Um, it's mostly formal and it's also completely combinatorial. First, you use properties of the group where it's involved. And um, in particular, the category of operatic trees. And then you can extract all the combinatorics and look that everything is natural. I don't want to do that. I have one minute. Yes, okay. So, um, examples. So, how do I really get this one? Well, you need to take core. So what is it to take core? Well, you start with a P tree. And you just return its combinatorial core. That's uh, its flat part. Um, that you can check at the simplicial level. That's what's called a Kulf simplicial map. 
So it automatically induces a co-algebra homomorphism. And this will give uh, precisely the Kalak uh, Ibrahim Ifat Manchon in both cases. Um, now, this taking core is interesting because the two sided bar construction of an operat is always a Siegel space. But when you take core, you destroy the Siegelness, and what you get is only a decomposition space. So this is a Siegel space. This is only a decomposition space. I just said this because I need to put this word into every talk I give. Uh, another example, and then I finish. Um, you take P to be the identity monad. So that's really as simple as, as it gets. And then you get uh, the Fadi Bruno uh, comodule bi algebra. That's the comodule bi algebra dual to multiplication and substitution of formal power series. So that's already a very rich object, and it all uh, comes from just applying all this machinery to the simplest of all cases, namely the identity model. Um, and let me stop here. Okay, thank you very much for the talk. All right, we're open to questions, so please do not interrupt uh, during the Zoom call. Either raise your hand using Zoom or write them in the chat. Better if you write on the Zulip chat. So there's already one in the chat. So Tobias Fritz was asking. So there, there's already one. Tobias Fritz was asking, is the group structure on the B series related to the jet group? The jet group. Now what group? The jet group. Okay, the, if you go to the chat, there's a link. But uh, of course, we can also answer this offline in case. Mm. I'm, I'm referring to the, the, the group of jets of diffeomorphisms. So essentially terms of diffeomorphisms, modulo identifying them up to yes. the first okay. few okay. Now I understand. Yes, it is related in the sense that if you just do the simplest case of uh, the Father Bruno here, then you get precisely uh, the formal geomorph diffeomorphisms. So the Butcher group is a kind of ramified version of that. So instead of just linear trees, you have branchings. So you have something indexed by trees instead of linear trees. So it is an analog of this diffeomorphism group in a branched context. Thank you. Okay, any more question? Okay, somebody's asking, is there one loop missing from the tree on the bottom of page six? That's very likely. Okay, let's see. Is this, oh, sorry, I need to change camera. It's very fast. Um, a loop missing where? Yes, here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so, uh, okay, somebody else is asking, are the letters E and B coming from bundles? Yes. So they are exactly the, um, um, yes. Yeah, uh, maybe I just answered this. Okay, then we have uh, Paul Sobochinsky has an answer, uh, has a question, sorry. Uh, yeah, Paul, feel free to unmute and ask. Okay, uh, thanks, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi, uh, so from a very high level perspective, uh, I'm just gonna give, me, give you like a, a, a five second um, summary of what I understood, right? So you have these two different ways of decomposing operads. In a kind of a kind of a combinatorial way, and the okay. bar, and this, the main theorem tells tells me about the way they're related, right? That yeah. one is kind of a homomorphic with respect to the other one. Mm -hmm. is, is that right? 
Uh, yes, that's a good short summary. So I'm just wondering why, okay, it's kind of a, it's kind of a very uh, maybe computer science like question, but why, why do we care about this? Like other, what are the kinds of applications or the kinds of insights that, that lead from this observation? Maybe that, that's, that's the question. I mean, I think to put it very um, naively, it's always nicer to have two operations than just one operation. So if you just do addition for many years, you come to a point where you can really speed up computations by using multiplication instead. Maybe you, I don't know if that's true, but that's how I imagine uh, calculations. Um, so having two operations is much more powerful than just having one. So uh, realizing that there are these two interacting structures on, on trees, uh, it has important practical implications. So in numerical analysis, uh, for example, the second product on butcher series, which is called substitution, naturally enough, is related to, to backward error analysis and something called pre-processed integrators. It's really something you use. Okay, we have another question. Namely, uh, Nathaniel Arker is asking, the P star and P circle constructions are related to multiplication and composition of formal power series yes. respectively. Are there nice categorical interpretations of similar constructions corresponding to other operations on formal power series? And if so, does this process of considering the two-sided bar construction on other operation lead to interesting relationships? For example, to P star and P circle um, and so on? I think the, question, the answer is I don't know. But I mean, um, formal power series has a very nice categorical uh, version in, in uh, species and analytic functors. And um, once you step up to groupoids, analytic functor is the same thing as polynomial functor. Uh, so there's quite a lot of nice thing you can do with all kinds of operations on formal power series, including differentiation. Um, but I'm not completely sure how well it relates to these simplicial viewpoints. That I don't know. Nice. Any more questions? Yeah, there's one, Remy is asking. So in P-Circle, you compose trees operatically where not all the branches will be linked to inputs. It seems that some edges can take input trees and others cannot. Is this an extra information in the specification of the object of P0? Does that mean that the trees in P0 are not exactly the same as in P-Star? Uh, sorry, now I'm reading the question in the chat. Um, edges can then input trees and other cannot. Uh, I think I'm not completely sure I understand the question, but it's important to note that if you have a tree like this. Uh, you should switch the camera. Oh, sorry. Yes. There we go. In a tree like this, uh, it's very different to have a nullary node, which is this, and to have an open-ended edge, which is this. So this does not count as an input in the leaf perspective. They're only This is a binary tree <coughs> in P star. Uh, I don't know if, if that answers the question. Um, Sorry, you're talking about P circ. Um, in P circ, the so if I have a tree like this and I want to substitute something into here, 
I cannot put this one. It cannot go in because it has only two leaves. So I would need to have one more leaf and I would need also a bijection between these leaves and these incoming edges. And the color should also match and so on. Um, so I think there's no distinction. Uh, I think I misunderstand the question maybe. Uh, so maybe Remy, can you clarify the question? Uh, yeah. So how do you specify non-leaf um, terminal? Um, so those branches that are not input but are, are leaves. So if we're talking about this one, then the leaves are only a question of type checking because they check which trees can be substituted into which nodes. So these are only about the types because the types are now B. So B is about the outer shape of a corolla. All right, okay. Okay, it's just a matter of how we construct the trees and, and disappear in the construction. Okay, thanks. Very good, so any more questions? Okay, uh, there doesn't seem to be any more questions. So let's thank the speaker again. Uh, thanks, Joachim. And in case there's any more questions or comments or anything, feel free to write in the Zulip chat. The thread will stay there forever. Okay. So yeah, okay, thank you. thanks to everyone for coming and let's move this online.